Good afternoon, and welcome to our TV show featuring documentaries revealing the realities behind myths using research and scholarship. I'm your host, Ergün Kırlıkovalı, and I will be with you every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You're welcome to send me your feedback at mythsandrealities.com. Dr. Heath Laurie, in his white paper published in Osmanlı Araştırmaları, which means Ottoman Research, Volume 9, 1988, page 13, set out a hefty goal. By citing examples from scholars who have written on the burning of Izmir in September of 1922 and juxtaposing these illustrations with eyewitness testimonies preserved in the National Archives of the United States of America, he intended to demonstrate that those who are deficient in the art of selection of archives may end up producing all the effects of falsehood. He also issued a friendly warning. Unless prompt action is taken to provide access to qualified scholars seeking to conduct research in the archives of the Ottoman and modern Turkish states, the history of the past will be written exclusively by non-specialists on Turkish history who selectively utilize the archives of the other states to buttress preconceptions with regard to Turks. To illustrate the point, he cites the secondary literature on burning of Izmir, which is available in Western languages. Not surprisingly, most of such studies have been written from the perspective of Greeks and Armenians. Consequently, the major body of source material so far utilized in writing the history of this event is that preserved in the U.S. archives. The conclusions drawn from this material were summed up by the Armenian historian Richard Hoanisian in his 1985 book, The Armenian Question, page 27, as follows. I quote, when the Turkish armies pushed the Greek forces into the Aegean Sea and burned the city of Smyrna in 1922, the Armenian presence in Turkey, except for Istanbul, was virtually eliminated." Unquote. As his source, he cites the study of another Armenian scholar, Marjorie Hausepian's 1966 book, The Smyrna Affair. A professor of English at New York's Barnard College and having written without benefit of the scholarly apparatus, which normally accompany works of history, Hausepian concluded on page 141 that Izmir was burned by Turkish army to rid Izmir of its Christian inhabitants. In so doing, she follows the approach adopted 40 years earlier by an American consul, one George Horton, pages 144 to 154 of his 1926 book called The Blight of Asia, an account of the systematic extermination of Christian populations uh, by Mohammedans and of the cul culpability of certain great powers. With the true story of the burning of Smyrna, Horton, as the title of his book implies, worked wrote in pages 153 that he believed that the Turkish troops burned the city because military representatives of the great powers had led the Turks to believe that they would not interfere. Horton and Hausapian, utilizing many of the same eyewitnesses, uh, are united by their conviction that the actual burning of Izmir was the work of organized Turkish military units. To anyone familiar with the Turkish nationalist struggle between the years of 1919 and 1923, the Horton-Hosepian school of thought predicated upon the racist prejudice that Turks are barbarian rings hollow. 
In September of 1922, the Aegean port city of Izmir was the long-awaited goal of the nationalists in their three-year struggle against the invading Greek armies. The staging point for the Greek occupation of Western Anatolia, it was the storehouse of all the items needed by the forces of Mustafa Kemal. Izmir's warehouses overflowed with much needed supplies of food, clothing, medicine, and weapons. Yet, within days of the entry of the nationalist forces, a massive fire destroyed over three-fourths of Izmir, and the victorious Turkish armies found themselves in possession not of the only real city in territories they controlled, Istanbul was still under Allied occupation, but rather with a smoldering room occupied by several hundred thousand homeless refugees. If one is to accept the horton hausepian analysis, therefore, we are faced with one of the few incidents in history where a victorious army systematically destroyed the fruits of their victory. A totally absurd proposition indeed. To counter the version of the Izmir fire presented in such works, we must turn to Western accounts written by scholars who are specialists on the Turkish history of the period. Names such as Bernard Lewis, Donald Webster, Lord Kinross, Richard Robinson, and Stanford Shaw come to mind. A quick survey of their works dealing with this per period reveals the following. A. Bernard Lewis, on page 254 of his 1968 book, The Emergence of Modern Turkey, wrote this, I quote, The Turks won a crushing victory at Dumlupunar, and driving the Greeks before them, reoccupied Izmir on 9th of September, thus completing the conquest of, reconquest of Anatolia, unquote. B. Donald Webster, who had served as teacher at the International College in Izmir between 1931 and 1934, wrote this on page 96 of his 1939 book, The Turkey of Ataturk, Social Process in, in the Turkish Reformation. And I quote, all the world heard about the great fire which destroyed much of beautiful Izmir, the preponderance of impartial opinion blames the terror-stricken Armenians who had bet their money on the wrong horse, a separatist national rather than a cultural individuality within the framework of the new secular Turkey. Unquote. C. Lord Kinross. On pages 375, 1771, of his 1965 book, Araturk, a biography of Mustafa Kemal, father of Turkey, and then again in chapter 40, The Burning Smyrna, wrote this, and I quote, the internecine violence led more or less by accident to the outbreak of a catastrophic fire. Its origins were never satisfactorily explained. Kemal maintained to Admiral Dumesnil that it had been deliberately planned by an Armenian incendiary organization, and that before the arrival of the Turks, speeches had been made in churches calling for the burning of the city as a sacred duty. Fuel for the purpose had been found in the houses of Armenian women, and several incendiaries had been arrested. Most probably, it started when the Turks, rounding up the Armenians to confiscate their arms, besieged a band of them, a band of them in a building in which they had taken refuge. Deciding to burn them out, they set it alight with petrol, placing cordon of sentries around to arrest or shoot them as they escaped. Meanwhile, the Armenians started other fires to divert the Turks from their main objective. The quarter was on the outskirts of the city, but a strong wind, for which they had not allowed, quickly carried the flames towards the city. 
By the early evening, several other quarters were on fire, and a thousand homes built flimsily of lath and plaster had been reduced to ashes. The flames were being spread by the looters. The fire brigade was powerless to cope with such a conflagration. And at Ismet's headquarters, the Turks alleged that its hose pipes had been deliberately severed. Ismet himself chose to declare that the Greeks had planned to burn the city, unquote. D. Richard Robinson, on page 74 of his 1963 book, The First Turkish Republic, A Case Study in National Development, wrote this, and I quote, The Battle of Sakarya began on August 22nd. By the end of the first week of September, the Greeks began to weaken. In another week, they were falling back. One year later, they literally were driven into the sea at Izmir, where they were evacuated by the Allied ships. The date was September 9, 1922. E. Stanford Shaw, on page 363 of his book, he co-wrote with Ezel Kural Shaw, wrote this, and I quote, on September 13th, a fire broke out in the Armenian quarter of the city. It spread rapidly through gasoline-soaked buildings, while the Turkish army's effort to extinguish it were stymied by the discovery that all the city's fire hoses had been cut and the fire cisterns emptied. In a single day, as many as 25,000 buildings were burned and half the great city destroyed. Perhaps the last atrocity of the war was the suggestion, quickly taken up by the Western press, that the victorious Turkish army was responsible for the burning, the conquered second city of the old empire." Unquote. This random, random sampling of the information on the burning of Izmir in works of Western scholars is a natural reflection of the lack of consensus on this question. Running from the silence of Bernard Lewis and Richard Robinson to Shaw's rejection of the charge of Turkish army complicity, to Kinross's determination that it resulted from accidental causes and Webster's conclusion of Armenian involvement, it is clear that no consensus exists among Western specialists on the founding of the Turkish Republic as to the cause of the fire. We must now turn, our, turn to an examination of the only archival material employed so far in the published works of, on the city of Izmir. Especially, specifically, the American archives utilized by Marjorie Hosepian in, in her work, The Smyrna Affair. A careful analysis of Hosepian's discussion of the fire establishes that she relied on three basic archival sources, plus a variety of survivor testimonies. Chief among her sources are a, a variety of materials preserved in the papers of Admiral Mark L. Bristol in the U.S. Library of Congress. In addition, she often cites materials from U.S. and national Archives, Naval Records Collection, Record Group Number 45. And from these, from the same archives, a variety of files on the Department of State. On pages 105 to 140 of her book, for example, she fails to conform anything resembling standard scholarly apparatus. To evaluate her use of sources, the reader must actually check the originals of the documents she cites. Given the fact that most of the relevant documents pertaining to the fire record group number 45 are likewise found in the Bristol papers, it is difficult to determine why Hosepian chose to cite these two sources in, in the manner she did, i.e., rather than referring to both, she generally provided a reference to one or the other. For her improper use of uh, number 45 files, materials on the fire see pages 255 to 251 to 55. While her analysis is supported by the sources she used, 
her use of sources has been extremely selective. As a case in point, let us now examine her discussion of the testimony of Paul Graskovich, the commander of the Smyrna Insurance Company Fire Brigade, relative to the origins of the fire and efforts to control it. Hosepian was aware of the existence of Graskovich testimony because she cited the following on page 20, 229, and I quote, Mr. Graskovich alleges that he saw two Greek soldiers light a box of matches on September 8th and throw the lighted box on the house of an Englishman. Further, that the Greeks said they would burn Smyrna when they left and that the British signal men on their ships were signaling to each other as follows. The British hospital is to be burned. On the 11th and 12th, Mr. Graskovich saw through his field glasses the activities of the Armenians on the Armenian cathedral and on the roofs of their other high buildings. A number of firemen saw from the steeple of the Armenian cathedral signaling in code known to be previously prearranged. Unquote. In his report, Graskovich described how houses exploded and burned all over the Armenian quarter. He complained to Kazim Pasha and suggested the area to be blockaded. He was fired on while at work and bullets made holes in his house. As if in anticipation of queries as to why she chose not to cite Graskovich's report in her notes, the annotation appears on page 229 under a heading which reads, I quote, three publications by the Turks give their view of Greek atrocities in Turkey and of the fire, unquote. Indeed, a thorough reading of her notes appended to the chapters dealing with the fire, i.e. pages 251 to 255, establishes that she completely ignored the testimony of Greskovich. More important than her rejection of the Turkish publication of Greskovich's testimony is her failure to deal with a very important document housed in the Bristol papers relative to Greskovich and his testimony. This document, a newspaper report, was written by Mark O. Prentice, an eyewitness to the burning of the city of Izmir, in his capacity as a member of the Constantinople Disaster Relief Committee and as a representative of the Near East Relief Organization. Located in the Library of Congress series titled Bristol, General Correspondence, Container Number 38, November 1922 to February 1923, is a letter from Mark O. Prentice to Admiral Mark Bristol dated January 11, 1923. It is a seven-page article. I quote, The hitherto untold story of Smyrna fire told by Mark O. Prentice, American representative of the Near East Relief. Armenians, not Turks, set the fire. Evidence of Smyrna fire chief revealed. Unquote. Given the extent to which Hosepian utilized the Bristol papers, it is hard to imagine that she overlooked this vitally important document. As its testimony runs counter to her arguments, one of the two reasons must account for its absence in her work. It's A. She missed it in the research of her work. Or B. She was aware of its existence and for reasons of her own, decided to suppress it. For the most important day-by-day -day account covering September 8th to September 16th, 1922, is that compiled by A.J. Hepburn, the senior American naval official present in Izmir throughout the time in question. Hepburn's report upon Smyrna disaster was submitted to Admiral Bristol, commander U.S. Naval Detachment, in Turkish waters on September 25th, 1922. It provides a day-by-day -day record. In his own words, Hepburn's report was intended to be a narrative of the significant and outstanding features 
of the period, with such comment and explanation as are necessary to clear understanding of the events, measures taken, and the general situation as they appeared to me at the time." Unquote. Selectively utilized by Hosepian, Hepburn's account of the origins of the fire in pages 46 and 47, located at the U.S. National Archives, Naval Records Collection, Record Group Number 45, Box 713, is totally ignored by Hosepian. Prentice, together with his fellow members of the CDRC, arrived in Izmir at 8.30 a.m. on the morning of September 9, 1922. Aboard the USS Lawrence, Prentice provided the following information relevant to Greskovich and his eyewitness testimony of the conflagration. He identifies Greskovich on page one as Paul Greskovich, chief of the Smyrna Fire Department. B. Reports on page four that Greskovich told him that on Wednesday, September 13th, 1922, that Greskovich had discovered bundles of discarded clothing, rags and bedding, covered with petroleum, in several of the institutions recently deserted by Armenian refugees. C. Greskovich, whom Prentice had first met on, on Sunday, September 10th, is described by Prentice as follows, I quote, I needed no interpreters as he speaks English fluently. He's an engineer, born and educated in Austria, and has been identified with several large engineering enterprises in Turkey. Twelve years ago, he became chief of the Smyrna Fire Department, which he continued to conduct in a very efficient manner. For that part of the world, during the Greek occupancy, unquote. D. On the week prior to the entry of the Turkish forces to the city, Greskovich stated the following, I quote, During the first week of September, there had been an average of five fires per day with which his crippled department had to cope. In his opinion, most of these fires were caused by carelessness but some undoubtedly were incendiary origin, were of incendiary origin. The average number of fires in a normal year, he said, would be about one in 10 days. And the increase to five a day seemed significant, unquote. E, following the arrival of the Turkish authorities, Greskovich applied for additional men and fi firefighting equipment Instead of helping him, the Turkish military governor, learning that there were still 12 Greeks in the fire department, ordered their immediate arrest, which left the department with only 37 men. On September 10th, 11th, and 12th, so many fires were reported at such widely separated points that the fire department was absolutely unable to deal with them. They were extinguished by Turkish soldiers. There is more, dear viewers, but I must stop here. It gets even better. Please join me next week to find out about the twists and turns. Thank you and see you next week.